Good morning, church. It is just so good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, my name is Louis Halbgoax. I'm the church coach and vitalization catalyst for Saskatchewan and Manitoba Northwest Ontario districts of the Pentecost Assemblies of Canada. I uh, sit on the national executive for the PAOC. I also am part of the National Revitalization Working Group, and I wear a few other hats. But ultimately, this morning, I am just truly honored to be with you. So as we start things together, let's uh, take a moment to pray. Let's bow together. Uh, Heavenly Father, today as we look to your word, we pray that the words wouldn't just be words written on a page, but they'd be words that truly come alive, that become a part of who we are, our very DNA. And as we look to your word, may we become the walking, talking, breathing word of God. May we become the hands and feet, the tangible presence of Jesus. And may we recognize that wherever we go, as followers of Jesus, the spirit of God goes with us as we are the temple of the Spirit of God on earth, both as individuals and as the corporate body. So God, speak to us today and make these truths very real for us, I pray. Amen? Uh, so today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share uh, a part of our story, and then I'm going to share a short message. Uh, so our family moved to southeastern Saskatchewan in 2003, we moved there to pastor two churches that lived 13 kilometers apart on a straight highway. Two churches that didn't like each other. And actually, one of the churches didn't even like the PAOC. But they'd come into the fellowship about 10 years prior because they wanted to try and find someone who would bring a pastor into the middle of nowhere. And eventually, we showed up. In the church in Carlisle, a community of about 1,500 people, my wife and I were numbers 11 and 12 in that congregation. Manor, the church about 13 kilometers down the road, had about another 12 people. Uh, the church in Carlisle had some church history. It had been birthed out of a church split where another church actually kicked the PAOC out. And the remnant, the remnant decided they were not going to give up. And for a decade before our family showed up, they just continued to have church with about 10 people. When we showed up, the question that God challenged me with was this. Would your community even notice if your church closed its doors next week? Would your community even notice? Would there even be a blink of an eye other than there might not be a few cars in a parking lot? And if you ask yourself that question and you honestly assess and you come to the realization that your community, they really wouldn't notice if you weren't there next week, it should break your heart. And it broke our heart. Because if we as individuals and we corporately are the, the temple of God on earth, the tangible dwelling place of the spirit of God on earth, and that was removed from a community, that community should ache. Because the presence of God is no longer there in that unique way. And ultimately, that drove us to move forwards. And then we came to these scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 and 22. Paul writes, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the weak... I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. And that ultimately led our congregation to come up with three declarations. Three declarations that we would agree upon. And those three declarations were this. That we as a congregation would do anything short of sin to reach people who do not know Christ. That we as a congregation will remove any barriers, hindrances, or walls that deter people from coming to Christ and his bride, the church. And finally, we declared that as a congregation, that we would make a difference, that people's lives would be forever changed because we were obedient to the call of Jesus on our lives. Anything short of sin, re-examining what we do as a church. Do we do what we do because it's tradition, because it's commanded in scripture, or do we simply do what we do because it's sentimental to us? Do we do it because it's the way it's always been done? As I said, my wife and I were numbers 11 and 12 in Carlisle. And as we moved forward over the next few years with these tenants in place, we've seen this incredible growth. And we went from about 12 to about 50. And when we hit 50, the original 10 that were there when we first showed up, they're like, oh, whew, pastor, finally we have enough people. We can start doing church. But my plea was, guys, guys, no, no, the reason that we've seen growth, the reason we've seen people come to Christ is not because we've been doing church. It's because we re-examined what we'd been doing and we started looking at what we could be doing in new and creative ways. Anything 
short of sin. Removing barriers, hindrances, or walls that deter people from Christ, coming to Christ and his bride, the church. What can we do to help kind of set the stage to make it comfortable for people to step into what we know as a relationship with Jesus and the church? Now, our building had some church history within the community, and with that, we decided that we wanted the church, the building, to be a place where people would would come in and mourn with, and we would mourn with them when they were mourning, and we would celebrate with them when they were celebrating. So we ripped out our pews, and we transformed our sanctuary into a multi-purpose room. And what we did in Saskatchewan is we actually bought a number of these large inflatable bouncy castles and we set up an indoor playland for our community in the sanctuary uh, during the week, during weekdays. Every Sunday during the winter, we would tear down the sanctuary, tear down the chairs and set up these bouncy castles. Then every Saturday, we would tear the bouncy castles down and, and set up the chairs. And during the uh, cold winter months, of which we have a couple in Saskatchewan, we would provide a a safe, fun, warm place for families to come. And it's just amazing. It's just amazing. If you've you've ever walked into a, a strange building, I bet every one of us has had this experience, and you walk up to this big wooden door and you can't quite see what's beyond, you're not quite sure, and you you kind of have this feeling of trepidation, and you reach out and you grab the door, and as you as you open it, you kind of peek in, and you're you're trying to figure out what's on the other side. We have literally had thousands and thousands of people come through our doors. And now they know where the washrooms are. They know where the coffee pot is. And people who don't yet attend our church come in during the week and they make coffee and they serve one another and they visit and their kids have this incredible place to play through something as simple as setting up an indoor play land. And there's nothing uh, quite as enjoyable as hearing a little three-year-old scream, Mommy, Mommy, I don't want to leave church. And I know, I know it's because he wants to stay where the bouncers are, but that little guy also knows that we care for him. And his mommy and his daddy know that we care for them. That we want to be a blessing to our community. Along these lines of what we would often call pre-evangelism, we also started uh, streaming our services about 13 years ago, way before COVID. We would just stream our Sunday morning services. It started really low-key with a cheap webcam at the back of the church, but it just allowed anyone and everyone to check out what was going on during a service before they physically stepped through the doors. They could catch a glimpse of, of what was happening. We started removing those barriers, those hindrances, those walls. And today, because we started that about 13 years ago, we have a a second campus location 50 kilometers down the road that we live stream services into. And we've had people come to faith through our online campus. We've even had people literally move across the province of Saskatchewan to be a part of our physical church, even though they came to faith online. And a while ago, I got an email uh, from a gentleman overseas, and he said this to me. He said, Pastor Louie, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts were when you started, a, started to video stream Sunday services. I suspect no one would have figured that a fellow member would be following from the Middle East in Qatar. That's for sure. There is actually a group of oil drillers, and there's been a group for about eight years of oil drillers that watch and do church through rural Saskatchewan, through our church, We're leveraging technology in our rural settings. In rural Saskatchewan, our model has always been to find one pastor. We plant him in a small community. We pay him next to nothing. We expect him to preach powerfully and visit the elderly and and do kids' ministry and outreach to the youth. And basically what we do is we just burn the guy out. We send him on his ways, and then we hit our knees, and we start to pray again and again to try and find another sucker who will come who we can pay almost nothing to again. But with the ability to leverage technology, we now have a vibrant, healthy church 50 kilometers away. And uh, that's why we named our church OneChurch.ca, because we were one church in multiple locations. Our final declaration, that we will make a difference, that people's lives will be forever changed because we were obedient to the call of Jesus on our lives. As I said, when we first moved to Carlisle, we moved to pastor two churches 13 kilometers apart that didn't like one another. 
Once we started implementing some of the changes and vision and, and stepping forward in this in the Carlisle Church, which is the bigger community of 1,500, and we started to see growth, and we grew to about, about 50 people. The other church in Manor, 13 kilometers away, in a community of 200 people, just kind of continued to, to plateau and maybe even decline a little bit. And at that point, with 10 bodies left in the Manor Church, they decided it was time to close the church. They really were just a subset of Carlisle. And in Carlisle at this time, we had about 35 brand new believers who had all the fire and passion in the world but had no maturity. And we didn't have enough mature believers to mentor them. And when Manor closed, eight of those people from Manor, they come, came and joined the Carlisle congregation. And they had all the maturity in the world, but they kind of lost their fire. And those eight mature believers from Manor joined these 35 new believers from Carlisle. And all of a sudden, the, the fire of the new believers reignite the passion uh, within the mature believers. And the maturity of the mature believers was able to mentor the new believers. In 2003, me and my wife were numbers 11 and 12 in the Carlisle campus. When we resigned two years ago to step into this new coaching role, we now have a campus in Carlisle, a campus in Redverse 50 kilometers away, and Sunday worship experiences in Carlisle, Redverse, and online. And there's over 200 people on average on a Sunday that come to onechurch.ca, and about 75% of them were brand new believers. And I just want to tell you, it is fun pastoring new believers. So that's my story kind of in a nutshell. That's my story, but, but what about your story? Us seeing hundreds of people come to faith should be the norm, not the exception. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you today about the call of God. The call of God on your life and the call of God on your church. Ephesians 3.20 now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, that is at work within us, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. I want to start today by asking you a question. When in the Bible did God ever give somebody an easy job? Honestly, I want you to think about it. When did God ever interrupt someone via burning bush or angelic vision or dream or, or whatever and say to them, I have an assignment for you. I have, I have a plan, a mission, a purpose for you, but don't worry. It's not going to be very difficult or take very much time. When did God say that in the scriptures? Go ahead, shout out the answer. The answer is nowhere, right? Because God never does that. God's call to every man, woman, and child is never small or simple or easy. God's call is always God's size. It's always big and seemingly impossible. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Think about it. The message today is entitled, The Call of God Doesn't Involve a Lazy Boy. Men and women of faith, the call of God does not involve a lazy boy. God comes to Noah and he says, uh, I have a job for you to do. I have a mission for you to undertake. I'm going to wipe out the entire human race and I'm starting the whole project over again and I'm starting with you. Noah, I'm going to start with you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down to the local Home Depot, except there isn't one. I want you to get some lumbers and nail and, oh, well, you got to actually create the lumbers and figure out the, the nails and the tar. And I want you to build an ark. You're going to face some ridicule, some hostility, but, but hang in there because I want to do the impossible through you. Now, not only do you have to build an ark, but I need you to collect all kinds of animals and, and house them and feed them and care for them and replenish the entire earth with them. And when it comes to the human race, I'm going to kickstart it all over again. I'm going to kickstart all of civilization over again from scratch with you and your little family. So what do you think? Small, easy, accomplishable in an afternoon? Not quite. A couple thoughts for today. God's call is always God-sized. God's call is always God-sized. And the second thought is this. God's call always includes God's promise and God's presence. 
God calls Noah to reboot the human race, civilization, and the animal population. But God says, I want you to remember my commitment to you. You will not go through this alone. I promise that I'll be with you. And I'll even give you a sign to remind you both of my promise and my presence. And that sign was the? It was the rainbow. And Noah said, all right, God. I, I don't really understand it. I, I don't get it, but, but you can use me. And at the age of 500 years old, instead of kicking back and enjoying his golden, golden, golden years, Noah sets out to build an ark. God then later comes to Abram. And he comes to Abram one day and he says, I have a plan, a purpose, a mission for you to undertake. I'm going to create a new community, the people of Israel. And I want you to leave everything that you know, everything that's familiar, your home, your culture, your wealth. I want you to leave everything and I want you to go to a land that you've never seen. I want you to make your home among strangers. Not easy, not comfortable, not, not a simple task. No, but, but God, there's no youth group there for my kids. God says, go. And as you go, I'll lead you and I'll show you where it is that I'm sending you. And never forget this. I promise you're not alone. I will go with you. And God gives Abraham a sign to remind him both of his promise and his presence. And, and that sign was <laughs> circumcision. And Abram or Abraham says, where's my rainbow? Couldn't you give me a sign that was a little less intrusive, like, like a secret handshake or a, a secret decoder ring or something? Well, Abram or Abraham didn't say that, but that's likely what I would have said. Rather, Abraham said, all right, God, I, I don't understand it all, but, but you can use me. A little while later, God comes to Moses and he says, I want you to free my people. I want you to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the earth, and I want you to defy him to his face and demand that he let my people go. And Moses eventually says, I, I'm slow, slow, slow of speech, and I have, a, I have a stutter, and I don't have much to offer, but, but God, you can use me. I accept the job, the call, the task. I'll do the hard work. And God, with your help, I'll accomplish the impossible. And that's the way it happens over and over and over again. God called on common people, common men and women, and gave them a plan, a purpose, a vision. God gave them a job, a task of immense proportions that was not easy, a task that required work and effort and that was impossible by human standards, yet was accomplished because the call of God includes the promise and the presence of God. Like Nehemiah, who rebuilt the city walls and gives the people hope, or David, who takes out a giant and an entire army of evil men flee. Or Esther, who risks her life to change the mind of a king. Or Joseph, who faced rejection and prison and slavery in order, in order to provide for the people of God. Or Daniel, who was thrown into a lion's den for standing up for his faith in an evil society. Each of these men and women who followed God overcame great trials and hardships in order to fulfill God's purpose and plan None of them had a small task or an easy job. Each of them faced unbelievable struggles in order to fulfill the plan of God on their lives. Christian author Max Dupree once said, never insult someone by giving them an easy job. And the truth is, God never does. God never insults us. And we see this also in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus reconciles the world to himself to show just how much God loves us by going to the cross and giving his life. And then, and then, because Jesus had done the hard part, he gathered his followers around and said to them, now you go into all the world. You go into all the world and have really, really successful careers, drive nice cars, build big houses and live safe, respectable lives and, and don't attempt anything too big. Just get by and take it easy. And we find that in the book of First Hallucinations because that's not what Jesus said. He gives the ultimate assignment to all who would follow him. Jesus says these words. In John chapter 14, verse 12, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. 
And then in Matthew 28, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in Acts 1.8, you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Brendan Manning, in his book, The Signer of Jesus, writes, whenever the Spirit of God breaks into our lives in the middle of the day, in the middle of a week, or in the middle of a lifetime, it's to announce in some fashion that the time for behaving hesitantly or indecisively is, is over. God's call is always God-sized. God's call always includes God's promise and God's presence. Men and women of faith, God has a call for you. God's call is not easy or comfortable. It's not easily accomplished in an afternoon. It won't be accomplished by, by spending countless hours in the lazy boy. And if we're going to do the same works and even greater works than Jesus, we must move beyond lazy boy recliner Christianity. God has a call for us, and it's going to take work. It's going to take blood, sweat, and tears. But we need to know that it is accomplishable because he is with us. The Spirit of God is in, in us, and we have received power. And you don't receive power to kick back on the lazy boy. You receive power when there's work to be done. God has already accomplished great things, but he's not done yet. People of faith. God has a call on your life, and that call is God-sized. But it's okay, because we are faith-filled, spirit-empowered, big-thinking, bet-the-farm risk-takers. We will never insult God with, with small thinking or, or safe living, because we know that God has called us with a God-sized call, and that he's promised us his, his provision and his presence in order to accomplish his purpose and his call. I hope I hear an amen. And if I can get a second amen for the fact that God's present sign to us is circumcision of the heart. Amen. Here's the deal. God has a God-sized call for you and your church. He has a God-sized call for you as an individual. He has a God-sized call for you as a part of your local church, your local corporate body. And even though God has a God-sized call for you, and, and even though he's promised us his, his provision and his presence, we still need to be willing to do the hard work. Because God's call requires us to work hard. That's our last thought for today. God's call require, requires us to work hard and take action. God's promise and provision and power and presence are only helpful when we become spiritual contributors and not spiritual consumers. We need to understand that the church does not exist for us, but we are the church and we exist for the world. God's promise, his provision, his power, and his presence are only helpful when you and I, when we go and make and baptize and teach. God's promise, his provision, his power, and his presence are of no use if we are simply content to sit on our hands or, or, or twiddle our thumbs. They're of no use as long as we are kicking back in the lazy boy. God's promise, his provision, his power, his presence are only helpful to fulfill his call when you and I are willing to work hard. And I promise that as we set out to do the hard work of ministering, not, not out of our preference, but out of God's purpose, that we will experience the promise, provision, power, and presence of God. God's call is always God-sized. God's call always includes God's promise and his presence, but God's call also requires you and I to work hard, to take action, to minister to those that God has placed us within arm's reach of. Church, I pray, I pray that you would step in to the full will, the call that God has for you as an individual and for your church. And that your story would be even greater than my story. That I would hear 
in the next days, months, years of the hundreds and even thousands of people who came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior because you guys said yes to the call of God, the call that he has placed on your lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that I've had the privilege of seeing so many people come to faith, but I pray that my story wouldn't be the exception, it would be the norm. And I pray that the church today, the church that I'm speaking to right now, that everyone who's hearing my voice would simply say, yes, God, yes, I want to step into the call that you have for me, both as an individual and as a part of the corporate body, the, the hands and feet of Jesus, and that we would be willing to risk it all, be obedient to you, to step into a God-sized call, to do the, the difficult work of ministering to the people that you've placed us around so that we could see people's lives forever changed. May we be obedient. May we step out. May we minister not out of our preferences, but, but directed and guided by your purpose to see people who do not yet know you come to know you as Lord and Savior, that people would have an eternal destination change because we were obedient to the call of God. Oh, Jesus, I pray, I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Louis, for bringing that word and for just speaking into our church and uh, into each and every one of us today. We're so gr grateful for people who are able to share from the Bible and share what's on their heart for, uh, for our church. And we just trust that that helped you and encouraged you today. And if you want to follow up with us in any way, you can find everything you need to know in the links below this video. Everything's at our website, clcwinnipeg.ca. And if you haven't visited it in a while, it uh, got a little bit of a facelift and got a little bit of a reworking. So it's a little nicer, works a little better now. So if you haven't checked out our website in a while, I'd encourage you to go check it out. And uh, yeah, hope you have a great week. Hope that you feel blessed and that you are encouraged as you go forward. And we are looking forward to seeing you all again. For those of you who are in Winnipeg next Sunday, August 8th for our 9.30 a.m. and 11.10 a.m. services. That's a traditional and a contemporary service. And we're so looking forward to being able to gather once again and to see everybody. And uh, yeah, we can't wait but we're still gonna have our online service. So if you're not able to join us physically, this service will still be here for you. And uh, yeah, we're not going anywhere. So have a great week. God bless you.